Hey, how's everybody doing tonight? What's up? I'm Lee Love, and this is Photo Mentor TV, and uh, glad you could join us tonight. If this is your first time here, we do this every Friday night at 9 p.m. Eastern, and the purpose of this uh, show is to educate, entertain, uh, encourage, and mentor um, new photographers, so glad you're here. Um, tonight is a special night. We always have a lot of fun tonight. I'm excited about it. Tonight is um, trivia night or quiz night, as we call it. And uh, so you're going to get a chance to uh, test your photo knowledge and actually learn a few things, possibly. We'll see. And uh, so anyway, that's what we're going to do tonight. If you, again, if you're new here and you're not familiar with... Um, the show and kind of things we do. We also have on the first Friday of the month have um, photo reviews. So you're always welcome to submit your photos and uh, we'll do a review on them. It's anonymous. You can use any camera, even a phone. And uh, that's also very helpful and a lot of people enjoy that's a very popular show. Just go to um, review.photomentor.tv and uh, submit your uh, images that way. And uh, again, as uh, if you are on social media, you can always follow us on Facebook and, of course, YouTube. If you're on YouTube, we'd well, you'd, you'd love to have you um, uh, join the channel and uh, give us a thumbs up and, you know, all that stuff everybody asks you about. Twitter or Instagram are also on there as well. And finally, we have a Facebook group. It's a small group that we, a um, little different than most of the other groups. It's really more education oriented. Um, and I answer every post and uh, try and help you guys with uh, detailed information about your questions. So, anyway, uh, enough of all that housekeeping stuff. Um, let's see, what else? I think that's it. If you want to. Um, join in on the quiz tonight. We'd love to have you uh, answer, you know, give your chance to answer some questions, see um, if you, um, how smart you think you are. I try to make the questions a mix of easy and hard and uh, some stuff like that to kind of mix it up so everybody has a chance. But anyway, all you need to do is just put the letter of the answer that you think it is correct um, in the comments, and we'll look at that. I don't have a way to um, to tabulate and give you a score yet, but I'm working on that. And um, so anyway, let's. Uh, we got uh, a lot of questions, so let's go ahead and get started on that. And uh, again, if you have any questions or comments on any of the stuff, just leave it in the comment section there on the YouTube channel, and uh, we will do our best to answer it. Okay, so the first question tonight is, um, what was the first photo uploaded to Instagram? Um, was it a um, um, was it a blonde girl on a beach? That's A. Was it a selfie in the mirror? Was it C, a dog named Dolly? Or D, a picture of a taco stand? A, B, C, or D? So, uh, again, A, blonde girl on a beach. B, selfie in a mirror. C, a dog named Dolly. D, a picture of a taco stand. Now, I know, you guys, this is kind of an obscure one. I don't expect everyone to get it. Um, but, you know, these are one to kind of edumacate you guys here a little bit. So, okay. So, time's up. 30 seconds. The answer is, the answer is a dog named Dolly, and it was the CEO at the time, the founder and CEO, Kevin Strom, uh, I guess it's pronounced this Strom probably, um, of Instagram, and this was a picture he took of his golden retriever puppy. They were in Mexico, and you know, they, you'll when you do any research on this, you'll say there was a picture of a dog near a taco stand um but the and the uh, the picture of the the foot was his girlfriend's foot at the time and of course there's a little more current picture of dolly in there she's really cute and of course i've i've had two goldens and they're wonderful animals so uh, anyway it's kind of interesting 
Um, you know, he, I think I read some articles about this and doing some research, and he said if he had known this was going to be like the, a famous picture, he'd have put more effort into it. But uh, and also, I, you'll do some research. You'll say that some people say they don't know the name of the dog at the time, but he, uh, that's not true. Her name is Dolly. So uh, hopefully that was uh, that's. I thought that was kind of a fun one. I thought it was kind of interesting. And um, it's a little obscure, I know, but uh, you know, I try to throw a little a little edumacation in there. Like I said, you guys give you some uh, in, some background on what's going on in the uh, in the industry. And, um, so not just, not just apertures and F stops and all that stuff. So, okay. So the, um, next one is, let's see the next question. The next answer, next question is what is bokeh? It's pronounced boca or bokeh depending on how you do it. Um, and, uh, so it is either a, you guys should be able to get this one. A Japanese tra uh, roughly translated word means film, or B, the quality of lens blur, C, the autofocus system invented by Dr. Koyota, and it's and his last name is B-O-K-E-E, -E. I that cut got cut off, sorry about that, and D is a technical term for ISO noise. What do you guys think it is? A, B... C or D? You don't have to, you know, just give us a guess here. What do you think it is? You don't have to be absolutely right. So, um, Sue Ann says it's D. And the correct answer is um, B, quality of lens blur. And I understand that's, like I said, it's kind of a, a tough one there. So, um, the, again, it's, it's pronounced bokeh or bokey or bokeh. I've heard it pronounced mo multiple ways. Um, but it is, it's the blur that most people talk about. And it's really kind of, I mean, it's funny. A lot of people spend a lot of money to be able to get this look out of their lens. And it's typically provided by a larger aperture. So, for example... If you have a lens that's like an f1.8 lens, you're going to get more of that blurred background than you will if you shoot or have a lens shooting at like f22. So the smaller the aperture, the less bokeh or bokeh, and um, the wider the aperture, the more. Now... There's also a couple other factors that, you know, if we want to get too geeky here, but just kind of give you some background on this. There's the, also the size of the sensor has an, a little bit of an effect on it. So a medium format camera with a like an F4 lens is almost equivalent like a 1.2, F1.2 lens on a 35 millimeter. And the same thing if you're using like your iPhone, the iPhone has a very small sensor, so even though you're using a lens, maybe it's an f1.8 or f2.8, I don't know what the lenses on those are, the, the, um, the bokeh on the background will not be quite as much. Now, let me just, I think this is a good point to mention, you guys. A lot of people misuse this feature. And I know as a, when you get a new photographer, they all want that nice creamy background. They say it looks professional and that's why they want to do it and everything. And that's true, but um, there's more to it than that. And that is that I almost always exclusively, I'd say at least 80% of the time, shoot on aperture priority. And the reason is I want to control that out of focus uh, amount, of, the amount of information that's out of focus. And so if uh, I don't want it to be too blurry, um, depending on the background, because that's part of the story. The background is very, very important to a photo. It helps tell the story or it helps distract from the story of the image of what you're trying to do. So if you shoot an image with a really, really... Um, you know, whoops, um, a really, really crazy um, um, bokeh with a really blurred background, 
it's good. It looks nice. It makes the subject pop out of the background, but it also means that that person could be anywhere. So it totally isolates them from the background. So you have to think about that from a storytelling standpoint. It's not just about making a blurry background and making it look aesthetically pleasing. It's also about including that. So in other words, you may want to not use f1.2 or f1.4 or f1.8 maybe you want to use a 4.5 or a 5.6 to include a little bit of that background to help tell that story so that's the deal on that and again i know a lot of people misuse the use of uh, of um, bokeh and they just really want that nice blurry background they don't care about being able to see um, and then, so anyway, that's, that's the idea of the, uh, of the bokeh and what the value of it is. So it's a really good, it's one of the most creative tools we have in photography because it allows you to determine your foreground, your middle ground, and your background and being able to tell um, what's in focus and what's not. I'm going to get into that. Actually, we have a question talking a little more about that in a slightly different way. Okay. So the next question is, um, during the 1800s, what was the most popular f subject to be photographed? A, bicyclists, B, horses, C, still life, or D, corpses? So um, what do you guys think that is? Um, doom, doom, doom. I got to get some countdown music here. I got to work on that. Um, so, uh, bicyclists is A, horse is B, C is lifestyle, and D is corpses. Now, why you'd want to photograph corpses, I don't know. But, um, so any guesses there? Okay, got a few. The answer is, believe it or not, D, corpses. <laughs> and the reason, which is kind of an interesting one, and this is, you know... I actually, you know, a lot of these questions I know, obviously, because I make up the the answers and stuff for them and, and create them. But when I go to do the research on the topic so that to give you more background and educate you a little bit on how these things work, I always learn something. And what I learned about this was that apparently because f the photography was so new, and so expensive that people would not have their pictures taken when they were alive. They would do it when they were uh, died. Now, the interesting thing about this, it's a little morbid, I guess, nowadays. But if you look at it um, and, and you do some research, you'll find that a lot of the photos I found, and I didn't post any, just thought it was a little too much, are, the, are family members posing with their post-mortem family member. So a, a child or brother, sister, father, mother, whatever, are in the photo with them, either propped up or whatever. And so it's a little odd, I would admit, and um, not quite sure uh, how that works. But anyway, so and anyway, one of the things I found out was that apparently these are very, very popular photos, if you can get a hold of them. And, but there's also some people saying that they are a little bit fake, too, that not all of them are real, and that some of the people posing the photo were alive, which is kind of strange, even more so. Anyway, so uh, that's the deal on that. Kind of, again, a little bit bizarre, I would say. So, yep. Um, okay, so the next one is... What year did Adobe introduce Lightroom? Okay. Was it A, 2007, B, 2017, or C, 1998, or D, 2010? Again, I know this is one that's kind of a, an, a little bit obscure, so I would imagine too many people will get this one. But... Um, I was a, a Lightroom user, actually, of um, version 1.0, but I was using a product on the Mac 
called Aperture at the time. And it was very, very similar. And then uh, Photoshop came out. Uh, Adobe came out with Lightroom. And honestly, it was just, it was bare minimum. I mean, it wasn't nearly as good as Aperture was. But eventually, they kept adding to it and adding to it. And it got better and better. So the answer on this one is A, um, 2007. And the deal was, it was kind of interesting, that was a code name Shadowland. And the this is a, uh, a screenshot of the original web page from Adobe in 2007. And in fact, if you look on the right there, it'll tell you, thank you, Lightroom beta participants. So they had a list of, they. this was unusual for Adobe to do beta, public beta, but they did with this product. And um, one of the original developers, Mark Hamburg, he'd been with the company for a while. And the code name Shadowland was a reference to a Katie Lang album. Um, and then they also brought on another engineer shortly after they started the project called... Um, who had, who I'm sorry, um, there was he's, they didn't list him here. Who was a veteran software? This guy, he'd been there with 1990. So these pieces, I think he had joined right around the time or was very close to the time that uh, the original developer um, Thomas, I'm gone blank on his name right now, also joined. So anyway, 2007 is when Adobe Lightroom was first introduced, and if you look down, the introductory price was 199. Um, which was kind of interesting as well. So anyway, that's the deal, and on that, and when um, pho when photo sh or excuse me, Lightroom was introduced. Okay, so next one is which of the following color spaces is not used by digital cameras, meaning. So a color space um, or color gamut is, is how the, the camera or device uses or creates its own color. So there are four popular color spaces that are used. Um, sRGB, I'm sure you guys are familiar with that. Profoto, which you may not be familiar with. Now, this is not the same Profoto that you think of when you think of lighting. That's spelled with P-R-O-F-O-T-O. -O. Um, then there's C-M-Y-K and R-G-B. So which of these is uh, uh, not used in digital cameras? A, B, C, or D? What do you think it is? All right. And the answer is C. And the reason is because... Um, CMYK is used for printing. It's typically, um, you know, you not, I mean, there's still, there's some RGB printers, but if you're talking about real four color printing process, that stands for um, cyan, magenta, yellow, and the K stands for black. Well, CMYK is a subtractive model, meaning when you put all the, the colors together, you get black. But RGB, or a, a, you know, a source like a monitor or our most modern RGB printers are an additive process. So when you add um, white, a red uh, RGB, red, green, and blue, you get white. So there are two different systems. One is for, um, again, one is for printing, and typically one is for uh, monitors and digital cameras. So... That is the um, story on which one is not available for a digital camera. Again, it would typically be the other th three would be, but CMYK is for inking for printing. So anyway, you won't find that the same way. So, okay, Let's see if I have any questions here about this. Okay. So the next one is, see what else we got here. The next question is, what is the best definition for composition in relationship to photography? 
So we're going to get into a couple of these here. This is a little artsy uh, related. A, a work of art. B, compelling arrangement of elements in a frame. C, a perfectly exposed image. Or D, the symmetry of image placement. So this is a little bit of a trick question, by the way. What is the best definition for composition in relationship to photography? A, a work of art. B, compelling arrangement of elements in a frame. C, perfect exposure of image and symmetry. Or D, symmetry of placement. What do you guys think it is? And Sue Ann says B, and she is correct. So that would be the um, correct image placement uh, or um, compelling erase, uh, el image of elements, placement of elements. So there's a number of different elements that you would use to create composition, uh, line shapes, things like that. And by using those, those are a language. And by using those to position or to use in your photos, you'll find that they um, can be very pleasing to the human brain, whether you know it or not. So again, it's a language issue where just like I, the analogy I use is if you're trying to learn French or Spanish or German or whatever, you have different, you know, or English, you'd have, you know, nouns and proper, um, purpos, prop, prepositions. You can't see, I need to take a language course. Prepositions and um, verbs and things like that. It's the same thing in learning um, art, design, photography. Those elements, um, there's elements there that you would use as well. So the answer on that one would be B, compelling arrangement of elements in the frame. Okay. Um, let's see here. So the next one is... Oh, wow, look at this. What is an, not an element of design? We're on a theme here, if you haven't noticed. So an element that is uh, something that's not an element of design, and again, this could be kind of a trick question. A, lines. B, color. C, exposure. D, space. And uh, which one you think that is? Which is not an element of design? A, B, C, or D? And C, you know. And so, um, of course, I say of course, Sue Ann got that one right. She better. <laughs> I've been uh, talking about this for so long, and uh, I know she'd get it. I, I knew I knew you'd get it right. So anyway, good for you. So um, so yes, the answer on that one is C. Now it could be a misleading question or answer, as I said, because or question, because you could you know um, assume that if you were to look at the um, elements of design, which are the most common, are line, shape, form, space, texture, value, and color. You could make an argument that value would denote exposure, but exposure is, and it's really, and again, if you want to get technical about it, you could say that exposure is the lightness and darkness, but generally, exposure is the lightness, dark, darkness of the entire image, but uh, really it's not one of the seven. Exposure is not one of the seven because you wouldn't, if you were an artist and you were drawing with pencil, for example, or charcoal, you could still control the value and that would not be considered exposure. So um, anyway, so in the elements of art, we're talking about um, and this is something that I discuss a lot if you've watched this channel at all. And I really kind of harp on it, quite frankly. And the reason is because the elements are, are very, very important. Number one, you can't really create an image without using some of these, right? I mean, a line, shape. I mean, if you take a picture of a road or even if you're a landscape photographer, 
you're going to find or portrait photographer one extreme or the other you're going to find that you're going to run into using these one or two more of these in your photos whether you whether you realize it or not but again as i was referring to earlier there are really elements that help you create and connect with your audience because they're used to guide the viewer's eye and that's something that's very very important in a photograph that so many people don't do is they don't realize that something that I recall I use is I refer to it as the hero what's the most important thing in the shot and that's what I want when I look at my photos and I'm gonna crop them or whatever like well you know what did I miss here what's the most important thing that I need to make sure is included in here or that I want to draw the viewers attention to and you use these seven elements of design to be able to do that to do that so a line of um, you know diminishing return kind of thing lines would be one shape light color um, could all be used to um, affect where the a human eye goes um, when a, they see an object in a in a frame so that is why it's so important to remember um, these seven elements in the study now you can break it down even further because you, and we've done this before we've done a couple of shows um, one of them um, called learning to see like an artist and then lines there's there's a number of there's horizontal lines vertical lines zigzag lines curve lines and each of those lines have a different meaning so for example a vertical line means um, strength and um, height of course a horizontal line is more calming. A curved line is more calming and, and pleasing than that. A zigzag, a zigzag line uh, kind of in, denotes or the, inter, is interpreted by the human brain as chaotic. And so, anyway, it just depends on how these shapes, lines, forms, whatever are used and to communicate your message. So, anyway okay so okay so your next question is um, um, how do you create a blurred background without a wide aperture so let's say you don't have a camera with a f or a lens with an f 1.4 1.8 whatever but yet you still want to try and get some of that background blurred to isolate the subject from the background. So would you do that with A, you'd zoom in with a telephoto lens. B, you'd increase the ISO, which is the sensitivity of the camera. C, you'd shoot on RAW, which is a format you'd use to um, convert the image. Or D, you'd move closer. So which do you think it would be? A, B, C, or D okay just put just put your answer in the comment section there just put the letter and uh, we'll see um, how close you are so if you haven't done that already the answer now again this could sort of be a trick question the best answer though out of the four is to zoom in with a telephoto lens so this is something that most people don't realize that if you zoom in with a telephoto lens you won't actually make the image blurry or but it will appear blurrier I mean in other words the lens doesn't do it but what it does it brings the background closer and therefore it blurs out the image so and and bring and so it's more compressed so this is something that, that I try and teach a lot of my students is that if you if you don't have you know again a really fast lens back up and zoom in so let's say you have a, a typical 18 to 300 millimeter lens or 18 to 200 or whatever it may be a kit lens or lens that came with your your camera most people will zoom out and move and get closer to be able to get everybody in the frame well if you want a more pleasing background you want to blur that background a little bit because most of those lenses are you know the minimum when you're at 18 millimeter the widest aperture is 3.5 and when you zoom in 
um, they close down to 5.6 or 6.3. And so if you back up, though, and zoom in, even though that aperture gets smaller, you'll get uh, the effectively a, a, um, a blurrier background. Now, the other thing most people don't realize is that you can all, and that's why I said it's a little bit of a trick question, because um, you can move closer as well. The closer you get to an object, um, will be the um, the more the blurrier the background will be, or the shallower the the depth of field will be. We're gonna that's also we're gonna talk about that in one of the questions coming up. So anyway, but um, so it's not just about the aperture is the point, and I think a lot of people think that they think well I have to get this really expensive lens f 2.8 or faster to be able to get a blurry background and you, yes that makes it easier and you have more light when you do that so there's certainly a value in that but as photographers our job is to solve problems we don't always have everything we need in fact again if you've listened to me at all you'll say I always talk about the photography is totally a compromise we never have enough time we never have enough gear and we never have enough money. And so the trick is how do I make the best image I can given I don't have one or more of those things. And so to do that, that's sort of an example where if you take your lens and you zoom out or you back up and you zoom in, you can still get a nice pleasing um, portrait without having to have, if you don't have a lens, maybe you dropped it or broke it or it's in repair or you don't have, own one. It's just too expensive. So you can still do, you can still get that effectively that same look. So, okay. All right. So the next one is, what is the key feature of a macro lens? So a macro lens is a lens that lets you get, um, shoot, um, close up. So is a macro lens sharper than a regular lens? Is it B, gives you a one-to-one -one magnification? C, or most of them prime lenses, meaning there's no zoom? Or D, all of the above? What do you guys think it is? Um, so... Um, Hey, Sue Ann, somebody said, sent me a message saying they can't figure out how to watch the show tonight. Um, maybe you could post. I thought that, you know, there's a link right there on the um, on the Facebook page if that's if they can't figure it out. Maybe you could post something on Facebook. I thought I had done that, though, just reminding people to go to YouTube and watch the show if they want. Thanks. I appreciate that. Um so anyway, um, so what is the key feature of a macro lens? A, it's sharper. B, one-to-one -one magnification, typically. Um, C, prime lens. D, all of the above. And of course, the answer is D, all of the above. So a macro lens, if you're not familiar with the macro photography, is um, a lens that will let you get extremely close-up photography. So um, what happens, most people don't realize, is every lens has a minimum focusing distance. Um, and to do that, um, to get that, so in other words, if you get too close, even with a 50 millimeter lens, for example, it won't focus within a few feet. And so the difference, one of the differences in a macro lens is it lets you get very, very close, with some of them within a couple of inches of the subject um, to be able to photograph them. And that gives you, again, a more magnification. So one of the things that we talk about is a one-to-one -one magnification. And that's something you're looking for um, because that gives you a, a, a reference or a size of an image that's equivalent. One-to-one -one means it's going to fill basically the entire frame of the sensor. And that's what you want. Now... You can get some macro lenses that are not like that. There are some inexpensive zoom lenses that have what's called a macro feature. And if you flip it into macro mode, it lets you get a little closer. But most of the time, what you'll find is they don't give you that one-to-one -one magnification. 
they'll give you something less than that. And so you still have to crop it in digitally to be able to get that full, the large. So if you're, in other words, a good example would be if you're trying to take a picture of a penny or a, a coin, you got to get really close, first of all. But even when you get really close, it's not going to fold. It's not going to fill the frame. It's still going to be relatively small. But a one-to-one -one magnification would let you get close and still f do pretty close on filling that frame of that coin. So um, that's the deal on that. So that is one of the benefits of a uh, macro lens. Now I haven't done a lot of macro photography. I do have a macro lens. Of course, I end up loaning it to friends, it seems like, more than anything. And the main thing I use it for is product photography for my clients. But uh, I've never really gotten into nature or flowers or bugs or any kind of that kind of stuff. So that'd be something worth exploring, I guess. But I've uh, never done that. So, But I know a lot of people have. In fact, um, some of the members of the founding members of the Photo Mentor Academy are, uh, do macro photography and um, some of my students do as well. So I know Allie's into macro photography, and that's because she's in Australia, and she's in lockdown, and she says she can't go anywhere. So that's about the only thing she has to shoot. Um, and um, Claudia, um, one of the people that I've mentored out of uh, Romania, has gotten some amazing um, macro photography. And what surprises me about the work she's done, she's using. She originally started out using like a 55 to 200 millimeter kit lens, and the pictures were just stunning. I was really impressed. So she didn't even have what's a macro lens. She was just using her kit lens, and yet still came away with some phenomenal phenomenal res, uh, results. So anyway, that's the deal on that. Okay. Um, let's see here. So the next one is, um, what does the, now you, come on, you guys, you guys, should be, and I've got a misspelling in here, I guess. Instead of stated, it should be state, it should be state, should be depth of field, um, acronym for depth of field. This, I don't know what that supposed to, word supposed to be, stand for, I think is what I, it's S-T-A-N-D is what it should have been. So what is the acronym for D-O-F? Um, did I just give the answer away? I think I did. <laughs> um, oh, well, anyway, A, digital optical focusing. B, depth of field. C, distance of focus. Or D, data over fiber. What do you guys think that is? It's, you know, it's funny. It's one of those, one of those acronyms that becomes part of your language. And um, so I might have already given that one away. But... Um, so if you haven't guessed it, let's see here. Um, let's make sure. There's a little bit of delay between when my timer and the timer on YouTube. So I wanted to give you guys a little extra time. Okay. So the answer is it's the distance, depth of field, in other words. All right. So um, did I give that? Yeah, so, yeah, it's right. Exactly. Depth of field. So it, um, it's the distance between the nearest and the farthest objects that are in focus. Now, on this one, I got a little crazy because this is an important topic, and a lot of people don't understand it. So I got a couple extra slides here I created to show, give you some more information. But one of the things that's important to note on here is the last thing, almost the last thing I said on this is that the depth of field is calculated based on the focal length, okay? In other words, a 50 mil or I'll say a 24 millimeter lens is going to have less depth of field meaning um I'm sorry, more depth of field. Everything's going to be in focus on a 24 millimeter lens versus a 200 millimeter lens. So that's just the nature of the optics. So the length, the focal length is going to determine the the depth of field, how much is in focus and how much is out of focus. A wide angle. So if you're doing video, for example, and you're walking around, you're trying to show people, you know, on a gimbal or not a gimbal, the wider the lens, the better you are because more things are going to be in focus. That's the point. You're not trying to have to rack focus. 
Um, the other thing is, is the distance to the subject, and that's what most people forget. The closer you are to the subject, the less depth of field you're going to get. So, um, and then, of course, aperture. But everybody that's starting out seems to focus just on aperture, and they don't realize the other two elements that play into this. So, um, if you look at this chart here, so, um, the, again, this, this is a typical chart that everybody throws up in every Facebook group you've ever want to go to when somebody asks about focusing or why their images aren't sharp because maybe the, you know the, they focused on the eye or the ear or whatever and the and it so it's just very very shallow and they'll always talk they'll throw up a chart like this and they will always talk about the aperture setting but no one talks about the distance to the subject even i had to add that to this chart they didn't even have it in here but the distance to the subject also has a very bear, uh, an important bearing as well as the focal length. So for example, this is an okay chart or example here, but it's not it's relative, meaning they haven't told us what the lens is. So if that's a 200 millimeter lens, yes, you're going to have a narrow depth of field, but if the one on the but if that same lens with the same aperture setting, is um, at 2.8, and I'll show you an example of that as well, but it's a 200 millimeter lens, the depth of field is also going to change. So there's some really good calculators that you can get for your phone that will do that. You put it in the camera you have because the sensor size also has a bear, has a distance, has an effect on this. And so um, the... Um, um, so that has an, an effect on it. And then also, again, so it's not just the aperture. Uh, there's more to it than that. And um, so that's, and I have one more slide I want to show you here. But before I do, I want to welcome Edgar. Hello, Edgar. Thanks for joining us. And yes, the answer um, on that one is B. So good, good guess on that one. So, and again, one more, let me give you one more here. So, uh, here's a picture by Gordon Gaines. Now, Gordon had posted this picture on one of the Facebook groups, and I thought it was a really good example. I hope he didn't mind me using it. He's asking, he says, hey, uh, you know, he tells about what his settings were. He said, should my pictures be out of focus because of the narrow depth of field at 2.8? He shot this at 80th of a second at f2.8 at ISO 3200. And he thought that, that he should have missed the focus. He didn't understand why everything was in focus. And the reason is exactly what I'm talking about here. The reason is it's the distance, it's also the distance of the subject, not just the aperture. So he's assuming that 2.8 is the real key here. And while that's important, it's um, the real issue here. And the reason it's everything's in focus is because of, of the distance and also the focal length. So what happens is, okay, if you think about it, if you're doing landscape photography, right, and you're photographing and you got the mountains and these trees that are like miles away, they're always in focus, right? There's no way to get them out of focus practically. Well, why is that? Well, the reason is because the lens has a focus point and maybe it's going to focus out to, let's say, 15 feet. And then after that, everything after that position is going to be in focus. It's called infinity. In fact, if you look on your lens, there's a little symbol, an infinity symbol, meaning when you're at that position, the focus is, everything is going to be in focus. So that's what's happening here, is that because he's far enough away, even though he's at 2.8, everything at that point is going to be in focus. I mean, you know, within reason, you can see the background's a little bit out of focus, but not much. But he's focusing on the on those on the player, so therefore everything is in focus. He's not not going to be so shallow, and maybe that's what he was asking. I don't know. He thought he had done made a mistake or there was a problem, but actually that's just the way the lens works. So hopefully that is helpful. Okay. All right, so if you guys have any questions about that, I'd be glad to go into that. All right, so the next question is, this is 
Actually, our last question for tonight. And the term that defines a relationship between an image's lengths. Okay. The image lengths mean height and width. So, that would be, it's called perspective control. It's called tilt-shift adjustment. Or it's called aspect ratio. Or it could be referred to as chromatic aberration. So the term that defines a relationship between an image's height and width. What do you guys think that is? A, perspective control. B, tilt shift. C, aspect ratio. Or D, chromatic aberration. You got it. Got it. Come on, Edgar. Throw one in there, buddy. Let's give us what you think that is. It doesn't matter if it's right or not. This is all about learning. Okay. Anybody else want to throw one in there? All right. So nobody else is going to be brave enough to throw another answer in, other than Sue Ann. So Sue Ann says she thinks the answer is C, and the response is. Yes, ding, 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 you are correct. So, aspect ratio has to do with the height versus the width. So, I see this problem a lot, by the way. People will take a photo and they'll say, hey, I want to print this as an 8 by 10, for example. Well, depending on the, on the sensor and the camera it was focused shot on, then it may not be the same aspect ratio of a 8 by 10 frame. So, in other words, what happens is you can print it on an 8 by 10, but it gets cropped off. In fact, if you guys notice, when you start looking at, if you have own a printer, a modern inkjet printer, the paper doesn't come in 8 by 10 anymore. It comes in 8.5 by 11. And also, you can barely find. There's only one company I can think of that I've run into that makes eight and a, or that makes eleven by fourteen paper. They now thirteen by nineteen, and the reason is this very issue of aspect ratio. The digital sensors are a slightly different size. They're close, but they're slightly different size or aspect ratio than a film sensor or a piece of film is. So therefore, you can't print a 11 by 14 per se, depending on the front, on the camera, because it doesn't fit. You're going to either get white around the border or you're going to get, you have to zoom, crop it to get, or trim it to get it to fit. So aspect ratio is a very important part, I was going to say aspect, Aspect ratio is a very important part of your photography, especially if you're printing. And, uh, and if you crop, you know, it's nowadays we're so used to just cropping whatever we want, putting it on Facebook or on Instagram or some other site, and you don't worry about aspect ratio. Um, well, actually on Instagram you do because they annoy the hell out of you by making sure the image is vertical uh, or square. Um, and so that is, there's a good example of where you have to have the right aspect ratio for your image. And if you crop it and you don't crop it correctly, when, it, when you upload it, it's going to trim it or cut it off or zoom it in, and you're going to be missing part of the image. So aspect ratio are the, basically the two numbers that define the height versus the width then they're not actually values per se, or they're not actually, you know, um, don't represent anything other than the ratio between the two. So, for example, I'm sure nowadays most people are familiar with HD television. So HD television is now 16 by 9 aspect ratio. But the old um, um, television or that, we grew up, that I grew up with, at least, um, was a 4 by 3 ratio. Okay, so it was a little bit wider than it was taller, but not by much. But obviously a 16 by 9 ratio is much, much wider um, for that cinematic look. So that is the deal on that. That help you guys? I hope so. Um, 
so I think that was let me look here I think that might have been our last question let's see yep that's it no more so, the le so I don't want to bore you guys too much but hopefully that's been uh, helpful and again the idea here as that we do on this show is to try and educate you and, ha and answer your questions um, and it's about you, not about me. And, um, you can look up my background if you want, but I'm a commercial photographer. Been doing this a long time, way too long, actually. Um, and, uh, I enjoy educating you guys and helping you and giving you information, accurate information on what you can take to make your photos better and also to make you more creative. So you'll find a lot of stuff I talk about here is about the creative aspects of photography, not the mechanics or the, you know, the what I call the techno babble. I mean, that's that's easy, quite frankly. Anybody can teach that or talk about it. And um, so... Um, you know, anyway, I think that that's helpful instead of, you know, again, it's that stuff hasn't changed in a hundred years, in my opinion. And uh, thank you, Sue Ann. You're welcome. I uh, appreciate that. It's awful nice to hear. Um, but um, anyway, so that's what we're doing here. So, again, just kind of quick reminder. If you guys are interested, um, we have um, on the first Friday of the month, I said we have the photo reviews and... Um, so, um, uh, again, doesn't, doesn't matter how long you've been shooting. It's not about likes or, or my, I mean, whether I like the photo or not. It's about does it work technically, artistically, and does it have a story to it. Any camera, doesn't matter if it's a phone or whatever you have, and doesn't matter how long you've been shooting. They're all, the, um, f all the reviews are anonymous, so nobody's embarrassed or anything like that, and that's not the point point is to give you real feedback uh, on something that can help you with your work so just go to review.photomentor.tv that happens on the first friday of the month so i think that's november 5th i think i looked up the last one so don't you don't have to wait for the last minute and you don't even have to be there to watch it if you don't want um, just submit your work and it'll be reviewed you can go back at any time and uh, and look at that and uh, Edgar you're welcome thank you very much and I'm glad you could uh, stop by tonight um, again if you are interested in social media which you probably are um, you can uh, follow us on Facebook um, Instagram Twitter and love to have you uh, really appreciate it if you guys would um, subscribe to the channel and uh, either leave a comment or like the channel I'm trying to get the couple of extra channel uh, subscribers there. I have a lot of fun doing this, and I hope you guys enjoy it as well. Again, Latin, lastly, is if you're interested in joining the Facebook group, go to photomentor.tv slash join, and I think you guys will enjoy that as well. So, hey, listen, thanks very much for everybody joining. I hope you got something out of this, and we will see you um, next week. Thank you.